Well, good afternoon, evening, or morning, and welcome to today's program on the Taiwanese economy in a period of transition. My name is Tom Gold. I'm a professor of the Graduate School at the University of California, Berkeley, and I'm honored to moderate this discussion. Today's program is the first in a series of three programs on Taiwan. The first to address economic and security issues, and the third is about the role of democracy and autocracy in the geopolitics of East Asia. This three-part series is sponsored by the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office in San Francisco, and is a collaboration among the Berkeley Institute of International Studies, Institute of East Asian Studies, and Center for Chinese Studies. If you'd like to learn more about their programs, be sure to visit their websites. Today's panel addresses some of the most important and timely domestic uh, and ex external trends and events that influence Taiwan's economy. We have three presenters. First is Professor, professor Lishuan Zheng, Zheng Lishuan, who's Associate Professor of Sociology at National Zhengzhou University in Taiwan. Dr. Zheng received his PhD in sociology from Duke University. He specializes in economic sociology. He works on the financialization and transformation of the Taiwanese economy and also the Japanese economy. Next will be Dr. Michelle Feiyu-Xie, who's Associate Research Fellow in the Institute of Sociology at Academia Sinica in Taiwan. Dr. Xie received her PhD in sociology from McGill University. Her research interests include economic sociology, sociology of development, <coughs> comparative political economy, and East Asian societies. Her ongoing research explores the variations and consequences of industrial upgrading among the East Asian latecomers. She's done empirical analysis of the different configurations of the state society linkages for innovation through comparative industry studies on Taiwan and South Korea. Her investigations focus on how technology learning and adaptation take place in a decentralized system of small and medium enterprise network production and the institutional arrangements that can facilitate or hinder cooperation and collaboration. And the third speaker will be James Lee, a postdoctoral research associate at the Institute of Global Conflict and Cooperation at UC San Diego. Dr. Lee received his PhD in politics from Princeton University. Uh, he wrote his dissertation on US grand strategy and the creation of the developmental state in East Asia. His research interests are at the intersection of political economy and national security with a focus on US-Taiwan relations. At UCSD, he teaches courses on Taiwan security. So each panelist will have around 10 to 15 minutes for their initial presentation. Then I will ask some questions and make some comments, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Uh, the Q&A button should be at the bottom of your screen and feel free to enter questions or comments uh, at any time, and we'll get to them uh, at the end. So now I'd like to turn it over to uh, Dr. Zheng for his initial presentation. Oh, hello everyone. Thanks for inviting me in this panel. Uh, my topic, will, I will discuss the basic structure of the Taiwanese economy, especially the how the supply chain economy uh, in the, uh, in the, I think the most important part of the Taiwanese economy. So when people talk, the reason uh, in Taiwanese economy, I think most important thing is how Taiwan develop a, I will call it supply chain economy. So I will make a very brief introduction and try to show how the, the uh, Taiwan's firm's position in this uh, structure. So I first give, uh, I give a short picture, very short picture that is, is beginning from 1960s so when US large retailers from Taiwanese suppliers. Uh, so for, uh, in the first 20 years, those Chinese firm uh, uh, establish a, a network system in Taiwan, so try to cope with the demand. And after 1985, some uh, light industry like uh, furniture, apparel, and uh, footwear, they move their production to China and ship Taiwan become a center of logistics. And also during this time, the, rise, uh, the ICT industry began to rise. After 2000, also the ICT industry, especially the final production moved to China, it too. And also 
light industry begin to move to Southeast Asia, and in Taiwan become the center of logistics and uh, some key component. I think the most important one is the semiconductor. So here is a show, uh, very short introduction here. So uh, I first show, as I believe the OS per node this company, I just tried to make example. So for the for the those companies making key components, uh, the most important is the TSMC, the semiconductor. I believe, uh, especially in the recent months, it attracted global attention because the the current shortage of chips and also uh, now only. Taiwan and the Korean firms making semiconductors, so that become strategically extremely important. Uh, so his largest companies in terms of market value, he, he, his market value almost 20% of the tiny star market. And also he had uh, about 50 million and, uh, sorry, 50,000 employees and they keep rising because he can, he still, uh, it's still, it is still uh, establishing new plans now so it's not largest foundry in the world and almost monopolize these sectors. So that's one type of Taiwanese economy and extremely successful, but there are also other types. If you, uh, it's success, it is it's very successful too, but it has very different structure and also more uh, uh, mixed impact on Taiwanese economy. This is a fast con, the largest company. Uh, he less than, he only hired less than 10,000 people in Taiwan, but globally he had more than 1 million employees. And all of his production are in China and the other place. And in, in the headquarters in Taiwan, many do some logistics things and also the financing. So that's the another type of Taiwanese uh, companies in the supply chain economy. And it's Bao Chen, and it's the largest producer of footwear. And also he hires fewer than 3,000 people in Taiwan, but globally he hires half a million employees. He produces 17% of the footwear in the world. And maybe the number changed a little bit in the last two years, but at least in the last three decades, it is the largest, uh, now it's still largest producer of footwear. So how do we know this? Uh, so I first look at the, the logistics uh, of the economy. So this I borrowed from Professor Sturgeon's graph to describe how these companies work. That is US company doing the, uh, did the, do the design and the sales. So Taiwanese companies only do the manufacturing. And he used a very, uh, I think an interesting term for turnkey solution. That is com US company simply give the order and the Taiwanese company arrange all the production uh, Globally, so he do the logistic and the, and the some do some financing in Taiwan, and they put all the production in other countries like China and Southeast Asia with lower uh, labor cost. So that's the become the largest part of Taiwanese economy in the supply chain. And uh, on the other hand, because we also saw the finance part of the Taiwanese economy is that. Uh, those firms with a lot of, they hire relatively few people, but they have a lot of overseas or subsidies. So in Taiwan, they do the logistics and also the finance because they are listed in the Taiwanese stock market. And also those foreign institutional investors, they have a, a great portion of this very globalized economy. So I will call that the uh, double globalization of Taiwanese economy. One is manufacturing, the other part is the financial thing. And also domestic controlling shareholders in the Taiwanese case, in most, uh, most cases are family. So the controlling family, they also use the star market to control the companies, to uh, receive dividends and uh, to uh, allocate the profit. So that's the structure of the Taiwanese economy in the, in the okay, global supply chain. Okay, so that's showing for so this is a graph, I mean, it's five years, but still similar, uh, I think structure is very similar now is that 40% of the market value are actually held by uh, foreign institutional investor. So what's this structure is looks uh, good, but they have a lot of problem facing Taiwan. And so many people will describe Taiwan have, uh, I would say high income trade. Uh, initially, people say middle income trade, but since Taiwan already, the GDP per capita already higher than like 25,000, so it's not a 
middle income anymore. But first of all, company has squeezing profits, very, very low gross profit. And for many ICT firms, especially for like a fast count, they have like 4%, 3% gross profit. So it's trim, extremely low. And they so they keep searching for lower labor costs. Originally, they are in the coastal China and they moved to inland and they also moved to Southeast Asia and not only to the fast count, the Baochen. They all did the same thing because they profit is squeezing and the, the all this US large brand, they have very strong bargaining power. So uh, the whole industry faced the, pro, the, the issue of uh, squeezing profit. And also for many other firms, they face, they face obstacles of key uh, components and most, mostly controlled by Japanese uh, manufacturer. Like uh, Taiwan has a vibrant bicycle industry, but the transmission uh, still have to borrow from the Japanese company. Also, Taiwan has a very vibrant machinery industry, but the CNC controller still can dominate by Japanese firms. So that's also a challenge because both the large, large uh, brand and all those supplier of key components, they squeeze the profit of Taiwanese firms and that makes some consequence. I will talk a little bit later. And recently, especially in the last about seven to five years, seven to eight years, there's a COVID rise of race supply chain. That is an increasing Chinese company, they join this supply chain. And uh, so in the, in uh, maybe like 20 years ago, that's the, the, the cross trade economy relationship is more complementary, now become more competitive because now they, they do, they, they learn how to do the supply chain and some of them are very, successful. So what's the strategy for some company like a fast Kong or Baochen, they keep searching for lower labor costs. Some try to build in brands like Asus and uh, Acer, and but the brands is not as successful as like Korean brands, like even not as successful as Chinese brands. We know that they were very successful in China. And uh, the only the more successful part in is, is look is like TSM, TSMC, they keep advancing the manufacturing process, become the world leading, uh, world leading manufacturers, and they try to widen the gap uh, with their uh, challenger. So that's maybe the. So that's high income trade, but by, uh, due to this structure, first, uh, wage is stagnant because profit is low, and all the menu, much of the job are shifted to overseas. So especially young people, they all have, have they face very low wages and uh, uh, cannot grow in. And also local consumption is uh, is also stagnant. Was also stagnant because uh, many employees just just uh, production shift out shift overseas. So uh, those local suppliers have some they, they have difficulty to cope with that. And also brain gen is very serious, especially. Except for semiconductor, they can hire globally the engineer, but at other sector, they, they face the issue of brain drain more or less. <clears throat> so that causes the issue, people are worried, and also I think it causes some, it do have some risks, is that we have over-reliance on semiconductor. And also because Taiwan is so focused on production, try to make a low cost production, uh, lag in internet-based innovation, which actually dominate the technology, the industry in the last, probably last decade. So Taiwan have like e-commerce and many, many other internet-based innovation. Taiwan simply uh, up, uh, <clears throat> and simply not there. So, so that's a problem. And uh, the, and also the, in 1990s, Taiwan get very uh, prosperous based on the computer sector. Computer simply lost its significance in the last decade because people use smartphone, people rely more on software, people don't change their computer that much. So, but, so the common, the ICT industry based on the hardware also being, uh, also face very big challenge. And of course, the many times the firm and the government try to push uh, upgrading, but in some key components and the materials, uh, uh, they are more and more Chinese, uh, Chinese firm and also have uh, very strong, uh, serious competition with South Korea. And uh, also have problems of governance because most Taiwanese firms are family business. And the, in the last decade, that face problem of succession because older generation, uh, they pass away. And so that's oh, how to maintain the governance and the management that's become a very serious issue for many Taiwanese large companies. 
So that's the uh, that's the challenge faced before the pandemic. So if you look at the Chinese newspaper, Taiwanese newspaper, missing they will talk about that. So, but recently we have because in this year and the last year, this year, many people described the Taiwan has the best economic condition in a decade or maybe in two, in in two decades. So every industry almost has. If you look at stock price, they keep rising. Every industry have some very strong growth, and of course, something is about Taiwan have very successful in controlling the pandemic. So many company even. For many like traditional sector, they have extra orders for normal production because their rivalry often their production often being stopped by the pandemic. So they have this advantage. And also Taiwan have sees the first net inflow of talents in maybe two decades or three de two decades because the new national brand for the successful control. So many like in Silicon Valley, they uh they move back to Taiwan, try to open new business. And uh, suddenly, the rising market position of TSMC and other semiconductor, and that's uh, in the past we worry about over reliance on, on semiconductor, but because all the uh, rivalry gradually lose and get out of uh, living in the market, so the TSMC and the South Korea maker now become the only producer of chips, and they certainly become very strong position and also benefit the uh, re uh, relevant industry friends. And also because like uh, uh, many people talk about the, the current conflict between China and the US, for many Taiwanese firms, that's a signal. I mean, it's just a signal because we, we haven't known the result yet, but something maybe there's a chance of getting rid of the threat from rail supply chain. So that's a kind of, because we now see more stable, uh, the US the strategy try to uh, restructure the supply chain, but. And so, so those companies facing the competition by Red Flag, they, they may enjoy certain uh, benefit, but still, this is the beginning. We haven't been sure. And we see surging investment. And so it kind of the ease of problem wages and employment. So do, do booming domestic consumption because people cannot go overseas. Taiwan has 24 million population. Every each year we have 4 million people uh, traveling in Japan. So you can imagine that how large the consumption uh, people consume in Japan. And the, in the last, since last year, people cannot do that anymore. So they, they're spending, they're spending ship to Taiwan. So issue after the pandemics. So first is the current growth sustainable for some sector, the, prop, the answer may be yes, I believe that semiconductor. But for some, some uh, sector, it's not so, so sure because we, we don't know how the extra order, uh, how if, if other countries goes to become normal and they can produce a rivalry can become normal, whether they can sustain the current uh, extra order. So that's a big issue. Taiwan. And uh, so the continuing expansion of semiconductor in the last two decades seems to pay off, but we can this trend continue and so that's, I think, the big issue, big issue and the challenge faced by the Chinese economy. And the third, thing, the third thing is that all the challenge I mentioned before the pandemic, and now we seem to have a, a better position to cope with them, but we can they really use this opportunity, the government and all the firms, and that will, be, that will become another challenge. Finally, is that we, now, we have a surge in investment, but we now see the limitation we now have enough water, we have problem of electricity. And because the current surge most, mostly occur in the manufacturing sector. So we, we now see the limit and can this be solved or we can have a better strategy that will challenge the uh, Taiwanese France government. But uh, in conclusion, still that's the, probably the base, Taiwan has the base position in a decade to solve these problems. So I, I believe the uh, the key issue will be how how well we use this opportunity, or we if we waste this opportunity, maybe two or three years later, all the problem will come again. And if we use this uh, opportunity well, maybe we can have a better solution to all these problems troubling Taiwanese society and economy for about a decade. So uh, that's my show. Uh, this show. Thanks for your patience.
Great, thank you very much, uh, Professor Jung. There's got a, lo a lot of thing is issues there that I'm sure we'll be able to discuss uh, after the other presentations. So now we'll turn to uh, Michelle Xie. Michelle, take it away. Uh, good morning or good evening, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and um, to follow uh, after uh, Professor Zheng's presentation, I think I'm going to tell the other half of the story of what goes on in the Taiwanese economy. So I want to start by uh, asking two questions that's kind of the dominant or prevail, uh, prevalent discourse in Taiwan or among the media or um, the question about whether, you know, is Taiwan, you know, is there such thing as increasing trade dependence with China? Or is, um, many, if you look at the, the two charts here, it, evidence seems to suggest that most exports are coming out from the IC information electronic industries over the years. And the other evidence, the question would, would be that like, uh, China looks like a Taiwan's largest trading partner. Over 40% of Taiwan export go to China. Um, so, th so there are the two two discourse I would like to examine. Um, is, so, is the question of Taiwan's economy overly dependent on ICT sector, or is Taiwan overly dependent on China? And my my argument first, I want to make a point that um, I think that uh, if you, re you examine the the detailed breakdown of the trade patterns, you will show a very have a very different picture. And in part, that has to do with the nature of the ICT sector uh, that has been highly globalized. And so Taiwan's trade in the global economy should not be uh, pigeonholed into the um, as a bilateral trade between Taiwan and China or like a cross-strait trade. And Taiwan's increasing trade export to China take place in the context of a so-called triangle manufacturing. I think Professor Zhang briefly discussed this whole globalized production where intermediate inputs are exported to China and final products are assembled in China for re-export to other countries. So when we look at, often when we look at those trade data, it's bilateral. Uh, the bilateral trade figure doesn't capture the, the dynamics, what goes on in the global trade and production, which is highly fragmented and, and the flow of production processes that across different countries in the region. So uh, my argument here is that um, so if you, you need to understand Taiwan's integration with China, it's been part of the global supply chain, uh, the whole globalized production process. And the surplus with China doesn't mean Taiwan depends on Chinese market for consumption for uh, Taiwanese good, but it's a reflection, it's a result of the export processing activities of global production, uh, where Taiwanese manufacture the intermediate inputs, which often such as semiconductor chips or other material goods, which probably uh, generate much higher value added, which are then finally assembled in China uh, and then re-export to the world markets. So basically the export in China to China is a result of those export processing activities. So should the export processing activity move to other countries that say now we see uh, the movement going south, so, uh, south, southbound policy to Southeast Asia, one would expect Taiwan's export to those destinations would be on the rise. Um, so this chart, I want to say that if you look at the breakdown of other sectors within Taiwan, uh, such as machinery or transport equipment, you could see a very a, a different, much more diversified export pattern compared to the ICT sector, and which it kind of just explain because ICT was much more highly globalized and go. Um, um, so, and, and if you look at transport, like the actually the major market would be the US um, and even for the machinery, the uh, export about 50% of export coming out from Taiwan go to, uh, uh, you know, up other than the top five export destinations. So what we are seeing right now, as I mentioned, um, this trade is a global trade. So what we are seeing is uh, it's, a, it's the reshoring initiatives or reshoring is happening. And then I use this headline. I thought that was quite telling. You know, the bicycles that when production, moved production to China in the 90s, 90s and one of the major manufacturer giant is saying that made in China is over. Um, and not just the... Um, Many of the Taiwanese firms in China are looking for 
either um, moving to some other production or more mostly the R and D are coming back to Taiwan, uh, or they are looking for assembly job in the Southeast Asia, and that has been occurring since even prior to the um, uh, in the mid since mid twenty uh, since probably twenty fifteen. Uh, but since 2018, there has been increasing reshoring um, motivated by the U.S.-China trade war. And also, at the same time, what's happened in Taiwan was Taiwanese government also tap on, um, has this welcome back investment action plan by the current government and Ministry of, by Ministry of Economic Affairs that launched in 2009. And that has kind of tapped on this, the, the changing um, geopolitical politics and trade war that has attracted a kind of um so the outflow capital used to go to china now coming back to taiwan for reinvestment and probably capital also coming to southeast asia but just to capture uh, an idea of what goes on is about 27 billion us uh has been approved for investment to uh, reinvest in taiwan and uh, most of the investment goes to either to ramp up their existing production facility or uh, probably for um, in, uh, additional investment in R&D and mostly in the um, in the, the, the so-called five plus two innovation uh, industries. And and I want to make make clear that the reshoring here uh, firms that coming back is not that like they left and now are coming back. But um, Many have come back to tackle, tackle the ecosystem and network-based production um, for product development, which I'll get to uh, in a minute about the, the dynamic of Taiwan's um, network system. And, and my, argument, my point is that it would have been much harder, like from the field work I've seen, it would have been much harder um, to rebuild this kind of ecosystem or to bring the, the, the firms back in if, had the root been had been taken out so that my point here is that the truth is the supply chain in taiwan never left so that's why reshore can reshoring can happen um so they're coming back to tap on the, the broader external econ economy and this holds true even in the so-called uh traditional industries such as in metal machineries many many have remained here um, and many are coming back to tap on the more the broader, you know, the, the, to tap on the, the, the strength and technology capacity the suppliers ha have. So, so the point here is that in this, the current wave of restructuring, we, one would predict that um, the relocation of production is dictated by where the cluster or supply chain goes, as opposed to, you know, a simple argument that, you know, the market, um, you know, the, the size of the market of the host countries. Um, so basically, so Taiwan's production in China is not a market driven, but it's actually, you know, it started with it's a supply chain. And then now the supply chain is moving on onward, uh, either to Southeast Asia or somewhere else, uh, or some of them come back to Taiwan. So I want to come to my second, qu the second question I, I raised about comparing so where is uh, is Taiwan's economy overly dependent on, on, on the ICT sector? Um, so uh, most of our understanding or, you know, when we talk about think of large, uh, those well-known firms like TSMC, Foxconn, that Professor Zhen just mentioned, we think of the ICT as, you know, the indicator of Taiwan's transformation. But um, in my work, and I've been arguing the other half, I have been trying to tell the other half of the the Taiwan story, which is based on this, the SME, uh, the small and medium enterprise price based uh, metal machinery sector, or even some of the light industry and how they have moved upward in the value chain and how they have performed uh, equally well um, in the last decade or two. And some indicators can try to show that this kind of upgrade, upgrading um, process and their uh, efforts uh, indicate such a strong export diversifications and also the very uh the how the part suppliers are directly uh, how the part supplier directly insert themselves in the in the value chain and become strong exporters themselves and the cluster remain uh countering to the the, the the assumption of hollowing out of taiwanese manufacturing 
Um, that's why I've been, that's what I mentioned earlier, why firm were able to come back and tap on the broader ecosystem. And the, in the, the end of my presentation, I'll briefly explain how this kind of dynamic explain why Taiwan was able to, to uh, churn out uh, the PP supplies in six weeks uh, last year during the uh, as Taiwan's COVID-19 responses, part of Taiwan's COVID-19 responses. And um, so just quickly to recap what, what I mean by the network production system, and I want to highlight some of the distinct features of Taiwan's post-war development, what I call is decentralized industrialization, where you have network of firms that cluster in geographical locale here. Uh, I show you the, you know, the cluster of Xinzhu, that would be the high tech, where uh, central Taiwan would be the, um, where the metal and machinery sector is, and the southern uh, part would be the petrochemical or some of the metal industry, and also now the, the, the semiconductor and also a lot of the uh, chemical industries, the, the, the clusters. And so, so the, the network was that they, they form the kind of specialized production, um, many suppliers uh, working with the, uh, together for a final product. And so that gave rise to the importance of the parts sectors and a highly internationalized parts sector. Uh, they can assert themselves in the supply chain, global supply chain. And uh, immediate consequences of this is the high inter-industry linkages. So you have multiple sources of learning and among information travel across industries, not confined with industry. And I think that's a very distinct feature that needs to be highlighted in understanding where Taiwan's learning capa and capability come from. A lot of firms' capability come from. They actually come from the suppliers, not from the, the firms. Um, and so here, I just want to show you uh, some of the performance of those selective industry in the, the I call the in the metal machinery sector, the dominated by SMEs, such as for example here, just to give you, don't go into the detail, but just to give you in over the past 20 years in the whole discourse about the hollowing out of the metal machinery of SMEs. If you look at the export coming from coming out from Taiwan, it's an upward trend of those industries, such as fastener, um, you know, the nuts and bolts and bicycles. Uh, machine tools or, or even auto parts um so it's it's been an, so you, you see an upward trend uh in for the, in the export and a strong export diversification um i show early in the early studies export to different market and what that means is that the ability for them to meet the uh, technology requirement for different countries and that often uh for example a strict requirement from eu or from the us and that often generate much higher value added. And also that's an indicator of the technology capability. And so here, I want to just give you a breakdown of what happens if you look at the, the uh, revenue uh, or the value added within the manufacturing sector of Taiwan's economy, the breakdown by the four major um, industries. And the blue the blue bar, is, that's where the ICT is. You see it's predominantly if you look just to look at revenue, it's about over 50% in 2016. And, and the, the metal machinery, it's only about 20%. But if you look at value added, the picture is slightly different. Um, the, the metal machinery constitute about 23% um, from 26 and 3%. And, and uh, semiconductor, it's within the blue bar constitute moving from 17% in 2011, I'm talking about value added, um, to 2016 is about 25%. So in that sense, semiconductor itself, is, it, it's becoming increasingly important, but also you, you see that metal machinery hasn't, it still cons constitute together with the, the textile and light industry constitute about one third of Taiwan's value added. But I want to highlight was like the computer and electronics, like the assemblies, like be, like when Professor Chen talked about Foxconn or ASUS, they generate much revenue, but the value added of the computer sector itself is about only 7% of the value added, um, despite they capture over 30% of revenue of Taiwan's um, manufacturing sector. So that's a great contrast with the metal machinery sector. I'm, I'm, um, I've been studying so that I just want to bring that point to see I think the the the, the transformation or the economy in Taiwan is much more broad and diverse than 
the dominant discourse of the ICT sector. Um, so um, I want to briefly talk about, so in this net, the, the, the network production system I just described, um, in addition to the network among firms, um, network and uh, uh, highly connected with the government, uh, the state, uh, the state agency, the lower rank state is such as Industrial Development Bureau, and they're connected with a lot of the industry specific R&D centers. Uh, they're loosely coupled. Uh, in the, it's, so it's not a kind of top down interaction, but it's more horizontal uh, interaction in the sense that they connect uh, different suppliers or different SMEs uh, solving their problems, establish the technical capacity needed to succeed in the export market. Um, and how they are all connected together. And that was kind of what was went on in the metal machinery sector in the in the last two decades. And I often call them, it's almost like a hidden, uh, you have got hidden champions, but you also have got a hidden developmental agencies, a hidden developmental state. Like they, everything go under the radar, but they have been a lot of the, <clears throat> the interactions um, in problem solving and technical capacity building. Um, and I think I want to use the, the Taiwan's response to P, uh, to COVID pandemic, um, COVID nineteen, as my example to show how the resilience of this network model. Um, so those two pictures are basically um, I took at the the P, uh, the mass machine um, equipment. Uh, they were very small, but they were able to churn out uh, ninety machines in six weeks for the mask. Uh, production. Um, so basically, to make a long story short, um, so that was a mobilization of connecting machine tool makers, volunteer working with the mask equipment, two very small mask equipment producers to come out to assemble those machines. But at the same time, you have got um, an uh, the upstream materials that were able to local the, the the milk blonde fabric you know the filter of the mask that you most people wear inside they, they talk about the importance of that filtering taiwan was able to localize that production um also within that two months and that was and the, the, the ability to to uh, uh localize the milk blonde equipment material uh, equipment that was also to tap on the the metal machinery sectors dynamic and that was uh, with the textile industry that has long term work with the 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 firms um, in the past and developing and testing methods and, and the equipment. So basically, that was able to shorten the the entry curve left barrier and the, sh the learning curve. So they were able to mobilize this and meet the 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 target, um, the churn out so many supplies in such a short time. And I think that that's just an example showing that the, this kind of broad base of industrial strength was demonstrated uh, in such in, in you know with the cross uh, cutting ties and inter industry linkages that was able to realize such a project. Um, just to conclude, um, I think my time. Uh, I just want to raise the question. Uh, I think that one of the future uh, challenges people keep asking: Can this kind of network production model that you know, has succeeded and did so well, continue to mitigate uncertainty in this, the new normal and the new uh, changing uh, geopolitics or ge ge international economy. And I think I'm, an, uh, I, uh, I'm a bit optimistic uh, compared to a lot of the people here in the sense that I think that Taiwanese firms have always competed in the global market. And its peculiar uh, status internationally means that Taiwanese trade with the world has always navigating uncertainty and trade tariff and productions. So I would imagine that we see the adaptability of the network production to, you know, to restructure in, in, the, in the current climate. And I think that to say the least, this part of resilience story need to be explained. Um, and then the second point is like reshoring and the new in, and the new technology race would dictate the imperative need to ramp up human capital investment. But I think that's a question not only for Taiwan but for many countries that are facing the challenge today. And reshoring, what reshoring means that is that imperative to bring 
uh, back the importance of vocational training and how do you and also the importance of skilled labor and the, the challenge is how do we pe bring people back to the so so called smart manufacturing and the last challenge uh, uh, ultimate challenge is the threats from china i think both economically and politically and china as we know are using this kind of practice uh, accessing leading technology through through uh, Taiwanese firms by scouting personnel, merge and acquisition, and many other practices have observed in many other countries as well. Um, but I think that the tension across the Taiwan Strait will add a uncertainty to firms. But I think I want to make the point that those challenges are political and has always been there. Uh, but those challenges are not the result from losing prime access to the Chinese market. So um, I'll, I'll conclude my remarks here and then we'll, we can discuss further during the Q&A. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dr. Xie. Also a lot of very rich uh, points and issues for us to discuss uh, uh, after the presentations. For people who have questions or comments, be sure to add them into the, uh, the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And now we'll turn last to uh, James Lee. Okay, uh, great. Uh, thank you all very much for coming. I'm really looking forward to um, having the chance to discuss these issues with you. Uh, so I'll be uh, focusing on uh, Taiwan's semiconductor industry, but I'll be uh, discussing these issues from the perspective of geopolitics. My work is primarily focusing on geopolitics and grand strategies. So I'll situate these issues in the international context to explain um, the strategic stakes involved um, for great power politics in, in the Taiwan semiconductor industry. So first, I'll begin by discussing the initial discussions of Taiwan's strategic value to the United States during the Cold War to provide a kind of um, a baseline kind of framework for understanding how the United States has historically thought about the strategic importance of Taiwan. So during the Cold War, the United States had a grand strategy of containment, and initially it was based on uh, focusing on the global centers of industrial power, what George Kennan called strong point defense and specifically on uh, Western Europe and Japan, because the lesson, lesson of World War II had been that if a strategic adversary or, or, or rival controlled the industrial resources of Europe and Asia, it would enhance uh, the military capabilities of that um, hostile um, competitor and uh, pro prolong a conflict in the event of, uh, of, uh, of a global war. So uh, during the beginning of the Cold War, the United States reflected on the, on the lessons of World War II and concluded that it was um, vital for the national security of the United States that the United States uh, preserve um, these strong points in Western Europe and Japan and keep them out of the control of the international communist movement. And in this context, there was a debate about how Taiwan fit into, uh, in, into this strategy. And there was a, a, a heated debate within the Truman administration between uh, January and June of 1950, in which there were competing arguments about whether or not the United States should extend its com security commitments uh, to Taiwan in addition to uh, Western Europe and Japan. So in these discussions and these debates, Taiwan's strategic importance to the United States was based um, exclusively on geography. Its strategic value to the United States was based on its geography. Um, General Douglas MacArthur uh, famously referred to Taiwan as an unsinkable aircraft carrier and submarine tender. So Taiwan's value to the United States strategically was based on its geography. Uh, of course, there were also um, uh, political and, and human rights issues, especially um, after Taiwan democratized, that added to the argument that the United States should defend Taiwan. Uh, but in terms of um, um, hard interest, um, Taiwan's uh, importance of the United States was based initially on the concept of Taiwan being an unsinkable aircraft carrier, uh, a submarine tender, its a central role in the first uh, island chain. And so it was primarily a geographic argument. And so during the Cold War, Taiwan was important to the United States, but it wasn't on the same order of importance as say, uh, West Germany and Japan. That has, um, now changed because um, since the Cold War, the, the consistent emphasis on Europe and East Asia has persisted. Even for um, strategists who uh, favor offshore balancing and um, uh, don't favor extended deterrence, Europe and East Asia are still held to be the most important regions. And even those grand strategists who favor a strategy of um, offshore balancing um, have defined it as a vital strategic interest of the United States to prevent the rise of a hostile Eurasian hegemon. And in that context, um, Europe and Asia have continued to be the most important regions um, for US grand strategy. But within um, Europe and East Asia, 
the lines of the defense perimeter ha um, have to be redrawn in, in light of um, the, the 70 years um, uh, of economic growth and industrialization that has fundamentally altered the landscape of where the United States vital interests lie within these regions. Because in the intervening 70 years, um, Taiwan's importance to the United States has grown exponentially. Uh, um, Taiwan's semiconductor industry, um, especially the companies uh, TSMC and UMC are a critical part of global supply chains. And um, TSMC in particular has been the center of recent attention because TSMC has over 50% of the global market share for contract chip making and for the high-end segment of um, the semiconductor um, market, uh, TSMC has uh, almost 90% of, of the market for the, the, the high-end chips and the, the remaining 10% uh, or so is held by Samsung. And TSMC is a major or even an exclusive supplier to US companies uh, such as a Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Google, and Qualcomm. Uh, and, and TSMC is a major supplier to the Pentagon as well. The F-35 and US precision guided missiles uh, all use chips uh, that are uh, manufactured ex exclusively by TSMC. So what this means is that uh, the United States defensive perimeter in East Asia can no longer be thought of in, term, in terms of Japan as a crown jewel of containment um, and the rest of East Asia being peripheral. The, um, Taiwan and, and South Korea are now just as important to US um, vital interests as of Japan was uh, during the Cold War. So um, the, the, the patterns of industrialization have changed uh, the landscape of where the United States vital interests lie in East Asia. And um, in recent years, uh, there's been growing concern about U.S. dependence on Taiwan. And most recently, this has been reflected in the ongoing chip shortage for the um, global auto uh, industry. Uh, as you may be um, familiar with, uh, the, the rise in, in demand for cons consumer electronics uh, in the wake uh, of, the, of the pandemic has uh, led to a surge in demand um, for chips um, that, that power these electronic devices. And in that context, there's been a shortage of, of chips for the global auto industry and it's had a, a prolonged impact on the auto industry. And TSMC doesn't think that the shortage will be alleviated until um, 2022. Uh, most car manufacturers have cut production. Uh, GM has gone so far as to um, permanently shut down uh, two of, of its uh, manufacturing facilities in the United States. So this is an ongoing issue for the auto industry, but TSMC is not just applying to the auto industry, it's applying to uh, major companies all around the world and also um, to, to the Pentagon. Uh, so TSMC's central role in microelectronic supply, micro supply chains is now a critical um, issue in US grand strategy and US national security policy. And this exponentially raises the stakes for Taiwan security for the United States. Um, Steve Blank at Stanford has written a recent article in War on the Rocks in which he has estimated that if China gains control of Taiwan and cuts off the supply of chips to the United States, the US electronics industry, um, military and civilian electronics would be set back by five years. And given that um, we advance from um, 3G to 4G in 10 years and 4G to 5G uh, in, in another 10 years, uh, a five-year setback would be a, a, a devastating setback for the United States in terms of its economic and its military competitiveness. So Taiwan now, Taiwan security now is not just about supporting democracy. It's not just a, about um, um, holding the line against authoritarianism. Those arguments obviously are still um, critical, but in terms of um, U.S. national security and U.S. vital interests, um, Taiwan also directly affects um, the U.S. and uh, security interests in, in, in uh, maintaining Taiwan's autonomy and um, ab ability to defend itself from coercion. So um, in this context, the United States has been exercising pressure on TSMC to um, help the United States to, to reshore its manufacturing capacity um, for semiconductors. And primarily, I, I think TSMC has been responding to the, the Pentagon's pressure on this point. So. Uh, the TMC announced on May 15th that it would build a fabrication facility or, or fab for its leading edge five nanometer process in Arizona. And uh, this is only just starting to um, get off the ground because the land in North Phoenix was purchased on December 9th and the investment plan wasn't approved by the Taiwanese government until December 22nd. So this is a fairly recent development. So even though TSMC has agreed uh, to uh, build uh, this, this fab in Arizona, it doesn't mean that there's going to be an, an immediate expansion of manufacturing capacity in the United States. We're still in the early stages of this process. Meanwhile, the United States has re uh, uh, 
required foreign companies US, using US technology to apply for a license to uh, ship to Huawei and to supply parts to Huawei. This requirement was announced in May 2020 and went into uh, effect on September 14th. And it affected TSMC uh, because TSMC uh, recently has been manufacturing uh, chips um, designed by High Silicon, the division of Huawei. So TSMC is a supplier both to uh, to China and to the United States. And so what the United States is doing right now is trying to restrict TSMC's um, sales of uh, and manufacturing of, of chips for Chinese companies and trying to promote uh, TSMC's manufacturing capacity in the United States. And all of this is happening against the backdrop of great power competition and the growing emphasis on uh, what in the policy world is now referred to as geoeconomics. The, importance of economics and technology in, in great power politics. Because this is uh, perhaps unprecedented because even during the Cold War, when there was a strong understanding of, of economic prosperity, um, supporting the con uh, containment of communism, there wasn't as much of, of, of an emphasis on the, the fact that uh, economics and technology were the key to military power. Uh, that that economic aspect of great power competition is much greater now on the, on the spectrum of issues uh, than perhaps at any other point uh, in, in recent history. So Taiwan's importance to the United States is occurring, is being interpreted in the context of great power competition and in particular in terms of the emphasis on economics and technology as the key to the future of defense and the key to the future of uh, great power politics. Because there's been a growing recognition that emerging technologies uh, such as uh, 5G and AI and quantum computing will have direct defense applications. Uh, for example, they'll be used uh, to power autonomous weapon systems and uh, they'll be used to uh, en enhance a mobile communication in a, in a way that is not just evolutionary, but potentially revolutionary for uh, the future of defense. So Taiwan uh, is essential to this uh, trend toward the, the kind of geoeconomic aspect of great power competition because uh, the 5G technology and AI, and AI technology and quantum computing all, all depend on, on hardware. And so chips are the, at the center of uh, these technologies. So the Taiwan occupies a central place, not just in a supply chain, but also in terms of the balance of power uh, in international politics. And so in this context, uh, TSMC has uh, been pressured by the United States to first restrict the supply of chips to Huawei and to uh, devote additional manufacturing capa capacity and to develop manufacturing capacity in the United States. And it's too early to say if this will work against Huawei because Huawei has been anticipating this move for quite a while. And since 2018, Huawei has been stockpiling chips in anticipation of UX ex uh, export controls and it may develop a uh, manufacturing capacity um, to substitute for TSMC. And right now there's uncertainty about whether or not Huawei uh, will be able to make this transition and to rely on alternative suppliers or develop its own kind of uh, internal uh, manufacturing capacity. But generally the analysts seem to be pessimistic about, about Huawei's uh, ability to adjust. Though still it, it's too, um, too early to make up any firm conclusions. But I wanna focus on U.S. dependence on TSMC, and to suggest the reasons why um, the United States dependence on TSMC won't be resolved by a quick fix of having um, TSMC just build one additional facility in, in Arizona, because the construction on the fab in Arizona is scheduled to begin in 2021, with um, commercial production scheduled to begin in 2024. And meanwhile, TSMC is moving um, forward very rapidly on uh, its um, next kind of leading edge technology. In 2021, it's scheduled to move forward with its three nanometer produ um, process. Um, initial production on three nanometer uh, uh, technology is, is expected to begin by, in 2021. And by 2022, TSMC anticipates that it will be uh, engaging in, in full scale on the commercial production. Meanwhile, TSMC is also in uh, the process of conducting R&D for its um, two nanometer process. So uh, TSMC is already move, moving kind of beyond five nanometer and starting with three nanometer and doing the R&D for two nanometer um, already. So by the time that commercial production begins at the Arizona fab, TSMC's uh, manufacturing capacity in Arizona will no longer be the state of the art. So that will address some US concern about over-reliance on supply chains based in Taiwan because the five nanometer technology is being used in the F-35 and precision guided missiles right now. But it won't mean that the United States will um, have uh, the kind of the leading edge technology 
and this technology will be somewhat outdated uh, within the next year or two. So in terms of the prospect for, prospects for stability, um, I want to raise these kind of conceptual distinctions because I think they help us to um, understand how TSMC's importance to the United States relates to these larger questions about whether or not uh, the Taiwan Strait is going to be stable in, in, the, in the coming years. Because this is, right now we're living in a time of considerable flux and considerable uncertainty about the um, stability uh, of cross-strait relations and about uh, how the US is going to relate to Taiwan in the near future. So I think um, this discussion highlights the fact that Taiwan's strategic importance to the United States, in addition to um, its geographic characteristics in the, in the first island chain. Taiwan's um, strategic value to the United States in terms of its role in microelectronic supply chains can um, be broken down into two aspects. One would be th the potential for PRC gain, uh, meaning that if um, China gains control of Taiwan, TSMC will then uh, be supplying chips uh, to Huawei and other Chinese semiconductor companies. And this will um, accelerate China's uh, drive toward technological and military modernization and uh, help China to fulfill its targets under the Made in China 2025 program. So what that means is that if China were to uh, gain control of Taiwan overnight, it would have a decisive advantage over the United States in leading uh, the technologies of the future. And there would be, that would be a mark a critical shift in the global balance of power between uh, the United States and, and China. So one aspect of Taiwan's importance um, in geopolitics is this idea of the potential for PRC gain. And also there's the potential for US loss, which um, as Steve Blank commented in his piece on War on the Rocks, if China gains control of Taiwan, uh, China will have the ability to uh, potentially um, restrict or even cut off the supply of chips to US companies and the US military. So that is the strategic value of um, Taiwan for the United States uh, as it relates to the semiconductor industry. So both of these factors um, strengthen um, the U.S. interest in Taiwan security and the U.S. interest in preventing Taiwan from uh, being being uh, coerced by China. And so as we look at um, uh, the future going forward, forward and we look at this, this question of whether or not the United States will continue to have an abiding interest in the security of Taiwan as it um, moves forward with plans to reshore uh, domestic semiconductor manufacturing capacity. The, um, the factor of the potential for PRC gain uh, will we'll mean that even if the United States succeeds in um, restoring manufacturing capacity and is no longer so dependent on Taiwan and its supply chains, even in that scenario, the prospect for um, Chinese gain, uh, China to, to gain from controlling Taiwan means that the United States will always have a strategic interest in the security of Taiwan and uh, Taiwan uh, now has a, a central role uh, in geoeconomics and great power competition. Um, so um, that's the conclusion of, of my remarks on this issue. And I look forward to um, answering your questions in the Q&A. Great, well, thank you very much, Dr. Lee. Uh, get back. Okay, so uh, we have a few questions coming in and I certainly would invite uh, members of the audience to, uh, to add any questions. Let me make a, first, uh, a few comments first. <clears throat> we call this uh, panel, the Taiwanese economy in a period of transition. But one of the themes that I'm certainly taking away, especially uh, James's remarks, is that Taiwan's economy has always been in a period of transition. And the, uh, the, just the elements of the transition uh, seem to change uh, based both on domestic issues and the larger geopolitical uh, context. And uh, members of the audience may have noticed that the panel is on economics, but none of the panelists are economists. There are two sociologists and one political scientist. And I think that was intentional uh, because we want to uh, emphasize that to think about Taiwan's economy, and James really emphasized this, it's essential to think of the, the larger socio-political context in which all of these behavior, economic related behaviors occur. And I think that that came through very strongly in the presentations. So that the uh, there's been a lot of discussion about the importance of supply chains, Taiwan's place in the supply chains, the red supply chain, and so on. And this is, again, in transition. We've seen over the years Taiwan's position in the global supply chains uh, change, both in terms of what's produced, the level of technology, capital, and so on. And now, uh, and now we see China, of course, is trying to follow a similar sort of trajectory and change its position in the global supply chains and the impact of that uh, on Taiwan. So. Um, one of the, uh, I think uh, a bunch of things uh, came out. Again, I thought these were terrific, very rich presentations. 
Uh, Michelle, quite uh, I interestingly, you, you, you said at the very end of your talk that you were optimistic. There, there was a note of optimism in your presentation. And I took that away as well because of so much of what we hear is really hand-wringing about uh, how, how bad things are and how bad things look. But your presentation really indicated the role of uh, the importance of flexibility, of ad adaptation, uh, meeting all the challenges. And one of the ironic things that came out of the presentations, uh, especially uh, Li Xuan and, and Michelle's, was the, the ir ironic benefit of the pandemic, that it, it has forced a lot of the manufacturers and the government in Taiwan and, uh, and, and, and scientists to think of creative ways of, of, pro of dealing with, uh, with COVID, uh, both on the public health front and also on the economic front. And I think that that's one of the, uh, one of, again, one of the positive elements, one of the victories of, of what Taiwan has been able to do. Now, um, I noticed uh, I have on, on one of the questions here that <coughs> our good friend, uh, James Lin, Berkeley product, uh, has asked two questions. And one of them is very related to what the first question I was going to ask is that Taiwan's economic success is often attributed to the role of the developmental state. Does the state now have the capacity to spark and guide the economy to resolve the problems you've cited? So um, uh, who was it uh, said that, in, uh, maybe it was uh, Li Xuan that instead of thinking about the um, uh, Middle level in, in a uh, middle income trap, we should think about a high income trap. And James's question is uh, for, for uh, Professor Jung, a high income trap seems to imply a lack of agency. What are the factors that are leading to this trap? And then this gets to my question what actions and policies can the Taiwan government take that can achieve real wage growth and achieve some income equality without sacrificing economic growth? So it, the, he's directed the question to uh, Li Xuan, but if anyone wants to jump in, this whole question of the role of the state, I think is critical. So uh, Li Xuan, do you want to respond first? Okay, thanks for the question. Uh, I have some uh, quick thoughts first. What caused the high income trap? I think I mentioned a little bit about the structure. So the I think the squeezing profit for Taiwanese firms in the supply chain, that's uh, one of the major reasons. And also I mentioned that like, Taiwan lack in the uh, internet-based innovation. So, so because the profit, the gross profit of the hardware production, and except for semiconductor, actually, uh, if you look at the semiconductor, the sector of semiconductor, uh, it almost avoid any of this, uh, the problem we, we discussed. For example, they don't have a stagnant wage. Like a TSMC, their pay is as good as Intel. That's what their, uh, that's their standard. So when they pay, they look at how Intel pay and then they pay at the same amount. So, so in the semiconductor sector, that's a uh, quite different story, but unfortunately not every industry uh, perform like that. So when you have squeeze profit, you begin to uh, you, you just have difficulty to raise wage and when you don't have a wage keeps be stagnant, you don't have money to spend. So all the retailer just become also uh, squeezed. So that's kind of a chain reaction, chain, chain, uh, chain effect of that. So how the government can do that? Um, uh, government do something, I think that uh, some of them are very successful. They keep trying to introduce new sectors uh, the problem is that because we now face more fierce competition than probably three decades, I think that's all countries like Japan, South Korea, all the developmental state uh, face is that, for example, Taiwan has the introduced the LCD industry in, uh, I believe, 1998. And it's still very large. It's kind of the, the second or third largest sector. But it also faced very strong competition from China in like after 2010. So people have a, 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 a term called four miserable industry. And the, what's the four miserable industry? And people say that's LCD, uh, solar panel, LED, and uh, DRAM, another type of semiconductor because like uh, TSMC is the main function, but the DRAM is not so successful in another sector. And of course, the, the situation is 
much much better in these two years in the uh, last two years but before that that they often have either have loss or have almost no profit or so so if when you have no profit you have no money to invest you don't invest in the most advanced uh uh technology then you keep losing and not only from china from south korea so i think that's one limitation so i think government do it i don't think government do it wrong that it's right to introduce the uh, some new industry, but you face more competition, stronger competition nowadays. So that's one thing that I think the nature of uh, the nature of the global competition in time was quit. The other thing is, of, of course, there are some sectors I'm mean, like how Michelle address, like uh, machinery. They are they do food well. There are a lot of this kind of small and medium enterprise, but. The overall picture, I believe, they still Taiwan still have a problem in the uh try to change the institution, and that's become because Taiwan have a red rigid institutions and uh, often have a face a lot of reason we don't are uh, transform the institutional enough institutions enough. So I, I believe that's one of uh the other reason is that, uh it, the real reason is the high income trick that we for example for innovation. But we have a if we have a very rigid system in terms of higher education and uh, many many sectors, so it naturally limited the possible uh, innovation. So people keep coming, people kept doing things in the uh, succeed in the last two decades, but the margin, uh, we use the economy term, the marginal benefit, uh, it's keep declining. So I think that's the high income trade, I mean the high income trade. So how the government can do, I mean, government should not pick the winner, but government should foster a more innovative environment. And I also believe the current strategy of introducing new sector, that is correct, but we also need to know its limitation. And like the recently people, uh, the government tried to establish the wind power uh, supply chain. And I think that's a uh, offshore wind power. So not only build a lot of uh, offshore wind power uh, 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 in in Taiwan, but also they try to encourage your firms to manu manufacture the parts and the, even the whole machinery. And that's a good strategy. And also bring uh, also kind of uh, coordinate like steel making machinery uh, industries other than the ICT. I think that's a good, uh, that's an important direction. The other thing is, of course, about weather type. I think that's more controversial. And even myself, I don't think that's necessary. The, uh, the right thing to do is whether Taiwan should further financialize. I mean, like Hong Kong, or Singapore, uh, you, 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 you try to treat the financial industry as the strategic industry. But there are side effects of that choice. Because, for example, income inequality in the, is two place is much much serious than Taiwan, so I will not encourage to do that. But I think after all, how to uh, and also the other thing, the third thing, sorry, I forget, is that tell how to improve a lot of uh old systems, how to reform old systems. I mean, sometimes it's easier to make a new ones, but there are many old old industry old systems they still survive but not doing very well. So how how to transform that? And uh, uh, I think that's also a very important part because if we only look at innovation, we, we miss a lot of part of the economy. I mean, even the US now, people begin to talk about how the, uh, maybe due to the political conflict, people begin to talk about the rustic belt, how, 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 how US focus too much on the Silicon Valley and don't pay much enough attention to the rustic belt in the Midwest. I think Taiwan should not make the same, and on the one hand, encourage the innovation, but I think we should look how to reform the old, those old industry, old systems. Like uh, recently, Taiwan has a terrible train accident, and I think the uh, Japanese Nikkei uh, Shinbun, they has a very, I think, precise uh, characterization of this issue. He said Taiwan has a dual system. One system is like semiconductor, very high, uh, very profit efficient work class uh, tech sector. One is very old, very uh, inefficient and very problematic governance. And all this also, not only the government, also the industry. So how to improve this, I think will also create a type of new space for future growth. 
So that's Great. my short opinion. Thank you. Michelle, did you want to jump in on that? Because that when you, you you're, I thought your discussion of, of um, decentralization in these various clusters of different types yeah. of small and medium enterprises uh, is very relevant to the point that the trend just made. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you, Tom, for um, bringing me back in. Um, yeah, I want to respond to um, some two questions. One is about the role of the state and also on the COVID uh, responses and also on the future challenges. Um, I think my key point was that um, I think that, you know, uh, I think what I've been trying to explain is that in the, in, in the Taiwanese experience, what has worked it's actually what I call the hidden kind of hidden developmental state with the, working with the hidden champions is in a very decentralized structure as opposed to the conventional image or conventional understanding of the top down kind of pick winner developmental state. And I think that's what make those clusters and what make collaboration works. Um, it's not about pick winners, but about uh, how do you solve the problems and how do you connect different uh, suppliers from different networks? How do you bridge them together and re um, re through some kind of recombination and the kind of innovation? And I think that's what we are constantly seeing in the field, in the metal and machinery sector, how, how things will work. That, you know, firms working with the engineers from metal, um, metal, uh, um, metal, research R&D center or varieties of, of industry R&D centers and working on solving their export problems and the technical capacity need to meet those requirements. And, and so that kind of, this kind of long-term um, linkages, kind of under the radar linkages between firms and the in, uh, industry institute, research institute, and also the government agencies. And I think that kind of reflected this kind of long-term linkages kind of put into a test during COVID-19 response. And that's why uh, if you want to explain how government was able to mobilize, you know, to build so many machines in such a short time, that doesn't come overnight. Uh, or it's not like the Chinese model, you get one company and then kind of tune up so many equipments, but it's actually how the, you know, through those networks, like they have known each other for a long time, like, machine tool industry talk about why they were able to they were willing to come in and put it because of, through their their prior inter, um, working with the uh, industry development bureau on the you know smart manufacturing project so they knew the gov they knew each other so they, they at the time of crisis they said okay we can come in and help and and I think that's kind of this kind of long-term preparedness and the same with the textile industry they have been doing testing for those uh, filtering materials that was in very low demand like in the industry for Taiwan like you know has a very small but they build a lab and they think this is important and then so the kind of coming this kind of preparedness come in when you uh, when in a crisis so this kind of put this kind of network governance into a test that's what I kind of so so put, to, to make the um, long story short basically I would see the pandemic response or this kind of was as actually a result of a long-term you know, this kind of network governance in the, throughout the past working uh, with firms in the past 30 years. And that's what what brought us here today. And that's what explain the resilience. Um, so it's not, um, so in that sense, I think the role of the state, so I think that if you dig further, look down under, I think the role of the state is very different in this new environment, especially when you facilitate that kind of innovation. And, and I think that in response to uh, Professor Zheng's comment, I think that, yeah, you see that in the, a lot of the new industries they create, I think it's not completely new, but it's often they're trying to draw resources from, you know, they look at what Taiwan is good at and they kind of draw those resources and trying to, how do you build the supply chain? So even in a semiconductor industry, there's been a lot of talk about how do you connect the, the machinery equipment makers and how can they localize some of the productions um, into the global you know, supply chain of the semiconductor chain or even in the chemical industries and material. Taiwan has been very uh, good at material science for broader applications. And I think that's kind of recombination. That's what we're gonna see, uh, I think in the future, uh, this kind of uh, process is gonna be ongoing.
yeah and like like uh professor uh like tom well said it's it's always in transition yeah and looking right. for solutions thanks james did you want to jump in on this because it's very related to your area of expertise as well yeah i um i have a, a question actually and it's a question that i don't think that there is really an answer to at this point um i, I think in terms of the, the idea of um, the developmental state uh, in Taiwan today. Looking at uh, you know how the, um, the, the Taiwanese government uh, received these requests uh, from uh, global auto companies to, and to ask TSMC to boost production, and TSMC being kind of reluctant and saying this is not a, a major part of, of our business. I think there is an open question in the future as TSMC and the semiconductor industry in general becomes more important for Taiwan uh, and, and Taiwan security the government is going to have its priorities in terms of prioritizing um, production based on these um, strategic and political considerations. And, um, but TSMC is going to be driven by its own kind of commercial interest. So how much appetite is there and how much tolerance is there in TSMC for these kinds of requests being driven by um, um, political considerations rather than uh, purely commercial considerations? So that's an open question. I don't have an answer to it. I just, uh, I, I like to pose a question. Great. Um, so there, uh... One of the issues that um, uh, has been raised in the in the in the Q and A is on the question of uh, I guess we'd say the the capability of the labor force um, is the technological requirements and then I had also uh, thought about question the demographic challenges um, I think it was forget if it was Michelle raised the question of vocational training um, there are a whole lot of again these are more sociological and political type of type of questions that need to be taken into consideration. Um, anybody have any thoughts on preparing, preparing the labor force and the role of the government in that to, to meet a lot of these challenges? Yeah, uh, I have some uh, opinion on that. So about the labor force, I think that Taiwan now has some, uh, in the past, we have a very, uh, I would say, complete vocational training system. Uh, now it's faced some challenge. And then the first challenge is that the low fertility. So for example, now each year we have pretty much about, I think it's uh, 100 and maybe lower than like a 20, uh, 200,000, sorry, a uh, uh, newborn babies. But like in my generation, that's 40, 44 per year. So, so now the, 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 we, we, we have a fewer people and we have, a, uh, so, so now the, I think the basic issue we'll face in the uh, Taiwanese industry in the future is the, the shortage of, of labor supply that will definitely occur. So how do we overcome that? And of course you can say it's many direction like automation or many other process, any other new technology, but you need to prepare that, that is because for many industry or many firms, they still kind of in the mindset that you can, you will have uh, a lot of young people, and that does not happen anymore. So, so that's the I think the basic uh, mindset, and a lot of how do you uh, direct your technology investment. So that will be a a very big challenge. And also about the I think in Taiwan, the issue is is really discussed is the migration issue. And so currently we, we actually already have a labor shortage, but mostly in the low skill labor. And we hire some like uh, temporary workers from Southeast Asia. We don't, they just work like nine years and they have to leave the sovereign system. That's not a, like uh, immigration system. And is that enough? I mean, we don't know because now a lot of, and those immigration workers only pay a uh, minimum wage. So that's uh, how the current system works. So people talk about how to attract foreign talent, every type of talent. But if you want to attract a foreign talent to uh, solve your problem of like a shortage of skilled labor or other uh, talents, then you need to have a more open system. But unfortunately in Taiwan, I think both the government and to a certain degree, the whole society are not ready for that. Mm -hmm. so, so I think that not only Taiwan, but you, if you look at South Korea, Japan, it's very similar. People are not very well have a real come not well very coming to like a lot of foreigners i mean hong kong and singapore are different they are uh, uh they are in different industry and a different history but like northeast asia that's similar 
So that would become very big challenge because if you have a shrinking population and you are not welcoming the the immigra uh, immigration, then you will have the trouble. Where do you find enough uh, uh, manpower to, to run the industry? I think that maybe five or 10 years later, that will happen. So, so that's the government and the society should face. And another question, for, uh, another short, quick response for uh, James' question about TSMC. And uh, I have no complete answer, but TSMC, they, their shareholder 80% are actually foreign institutional investors. And now maybe this year a little bit lower because uh, the booming uh, stock market, many more people invest in the stock market this year. But at least I guess 70% is still the, the, I think the minimum. So so now the largest shareholders for TM, TSMC, and the, so they somehow they apply to the uh, US like a shareholder model. So they somehow have to respond to their shareholders about the price of the uh, EPS, all these financial stuff. So I think the government, I think in the Taiwan, in the environment of Taiwan, government still can influence their decision to a certain degree, but also it's a very globalized. I mean, not only in terms of the market, but also financial. So how to solve this or reconcile this uh, conflict? I think that's, uh, but I think after all, government cannot change, cannot really influence their large strategy. But I think if you uh, try to let them make some, like for example, some, uh, chips for like a military or something. I think that will be easier. But if you ask them to do a very different structure of production or things like that. And the reason they agreed to Arizona is not, of course, their largest market for US. And, but also they, they, I heard from my friend from the uh, TSMC, they also believe that that's profitable. And uh, because Intel kind of lose in the manufacturing, so they see the market. That's also one of the reasons. So still, I think that's a that's a important issue, and I think we need to consider the whole, not only the manufacturing part, but also the control shareholder financial part. So that's okay, unfortunately, point. we only have one minute left. Now, Michelle, oh, yeah. oh, she's jumping out of her yeah. seat there. <laughs> I just want to quickly jump in. Um, I just want to respond to that question on TSMC. I just want to remind you. Don't forget that government still holds seat in the board in the board for TSMC. So it does influence. And then as for the chip shortages, I think that's complicated because that has to do more the technical issue, you know, to re to re divide the, the whole production for chip. That's just not going to happen over overnight. So that has nothing to do with. Yeah, you just I think that the issue is more, much more complicated than simply not taking the argument, not taking the government's instruction yeah and uh and in, in terms of labor shortage i think on the shop on the field we have seen i think that has always been a concern just not just now um and i think that but we do see that what's happening is that firms have become at least in the in the metal machinery people have become more um outgoing and more proactive in trying to recruit the, the, the skilled laborers and then there have been some programs put in practice about vocational training but of course more can be done but I think that we do see that more initiatives and more creative ways at, on the shop floor you have seen that people try to you know re bring people back into the the manufacturing yeah okay James did you want to have the final word uh, I just wanted to say uh, very briefly uh, it, in response to something Professor Jung just said and I think um, uh, James is um, question. Um, so a TSMC did uh, ex explain to the U.S. government uh, that the, the cost of labor is just much higher in the United States. And um, it I think their estimate was about it's eight to 10 percent higher um, to manufacture in the United States uh, than, than in Taiwan. So in response to that, at least they, they've said that uh, the U.S. government agreed to subsidize the construction of this facility to offset the, the, the higher cost. Um, so yeah. there is a recognition uh, of this um, issue for TSMC on the part of the U.S. government. And in the, the plot of land that they purchased, um, as part of my preparation for this talk, I looked at um, uh, local news in Phoenix, and they have a map of the, of, of the plot of land uh, in North Phoenix where um, they're planning to have the TSMC um, uh, plant built and it's, they're trying to build like a, a science park um, and try to build a kind of a, a, an ecosystem there. So there is a recognition that uh, of the kind of complexity of, of this issue, but um, whether or not they'll be able to actually create an effective ecosystem is a, uh, an open question at this point. 
Great, thanks. Uh, this has been a really rich discussion and I'm sorry I couldn't get to uh, many of the other questions uh, that had been raised. Uh, but let me remind uh, the audience that next Tuesday and Wednesday, there are two more uh, programs in this series. Uh, and the one on Tuesday is on the economic and security issues. And I'm sure TMC, T TSMC will be front and center in that discussion mm -hmm. as well. And one of the questions, unfortunately, we couldn't get to today was to ask James for his recommendation to the Biden administration on policy toward regards to TSMC and Huawei uh, in particular. So please come back next week and uh, put your two cents in. So I'd like to thank everybody uh, on the panel and the audience for really terrific discussion, a lot of very important issues that have been raised and uh, have a good, good day, good evening, good night. Thanks very much. Thank you.